Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, my name is Selena Robertson, and I work at the ICO as a film programmer, and I work on special events as well. Welcome, a warm welcome to our Travels with Tova special event that accompanies um, our screening of Travels with Tova, which is currently streaming on our platform until Friday, the 23rd of July. Travels with Tova documents Finnish writer and artist Tova Janssen and her partner of 45 years, the graphic artist, filmmaker and total cinephile Tuliki Pietela's globe-trotting travels in the early 1970s to Japan, Mexico, Hawaii and the States, accompanied by their trusted 8mm conifer camera and Tuliki's exceptional camera eye. Travels with Tova is the first film in a trilogy of Super 8 films that include Haru Island of Solitary, and Tova and Tutti in Europe. And the films are really significant because we don't have that many documents of a life of lifelong lesbian partnerships or even active older women. And they reveal this wonderful side of Tova Janssen and her partner Tuli Key, their humorous off the cuff funny and coded ways of observing people, animals, culture and everyday life and their passion for travel. At the end of Travels with Tova, Tova says, we had so much fun and you really do see this when you watch the film, but they were just having this hilarious time all, everywhere that they went, they were just making, making things just so brilliant for each other. So this event is held in partnership with Queer Feminist Collective Club de Femme. And if you haven't already, please go on the ICO blog and read So Mayer uh, from Club de Femme, um, their fabulous new essay entitled Island Hearts, Desert Hearts Traveling with Tova and Tutti. And Jenny Clark, who's also from Club de Femme, her Moomin-inspired um, embroidery. And we also want to acknowledge that this event draws on Jenna Mason's curation of Tova Janssen, an intimate portrait at Dulwich Pitch Gallery on the 26th of January, 2018. So before I introduce our guests, I have a few housekeeping things to tell you. Our event will run for 60 minutes and it will take the form of a discussion and two readings by Ellie Kendrick, from Tova Janssen's book, Fair Play, which was published by Sort of Books in 2007. The event is being live captioned and these should appear at the bottom of your screen, but you can also click the link in the chat to access a fully adjustable page of captions. If you have any questions throughout, this, throughout our session, for any of the speakers, please write these in the chat and we'll come to them at the end. The session has been recorded and will be available to watch on our platform until the 23rd of July. Now I'm just going to introduce our guests um, and I'd really want to thank them so much for being so generous and helping me kind of um, curate this really special event. So first we have Kinerva Siederström, who is the Director of Travels with Tova. Kinerva graduated with a Master's in Political Science in 1981 before studying film at Stockholm's Dramatica, Dram Dramatica Institute in 1984. From 2003 to 2010, she was Professor of Documentary Film at the University of Art and Design in Helsinki. Since 1985, she's been making documentary films, including several works based on Tova Janssen and Tuliki Pietela's 8mm material, specifically Travels with Tova and Haru Island of the Solitary. Ellie Kendrick is an English action writer best known for playing Anne Frank in the BBC's 2009 miniseries, The Diary of Anne Frank, Ivy Morris in the first series of the 2010 revived Upstairs Downstairs, and Mira Reed in the HBO series Game of Thrones. In 2016, uh, she performed the lead role in The Leveling, and she was brilliant, and that was directed by a good friend of mine, Hope Dixon Leach. Nat Yant is the co-publisher of Sort of Books, the tiny mm. publishing company credited with the UK revival of Tova Janssen's original fiction for children and adults. She and her partner, Mark Ellingham, have published Janssen's 11 classic meaning titles, four novels, five story collections, her authorised biography and her collected letters. And finally, we have Alison Williams, who is a freelance content producer, curator, as mm. well as Moomin and Janssen Fangirl. She also currently works for PRS Foundation, the UK's leading charitable funder of new music and talent. Um, and Ali is currently the co-curator of The Woman Who Fell in Love with an Island, which is the current exhibition at the Walthamstow Wetlands and the William Morris Gallery. So welcome all of our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. 
So I'm now going to sort of turn to Kenerva first, really. Um, Kenerva, can you speak about um, how long you've known Tova and also about, you know, meeting Tuliki and how you worked with them at this particular moment in their lives to edit and produce this wonderful travelogue, Travels with Tova, um, how you um, edited and created the work together. Yes, so, hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, I got to know Tove and Tuliki both already uh, as a child, when I, I was a child, because Tove had studied uh, painting and art at the uh, uh, Institute of Fine Art in Helsinki. They were together at the same course, I think, or, or anyway, at, studying at the same time. So I met them a lot during my childhood. Uh, my, my mother and and they were friends and they had all kind of parties and 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 <laughs> met together so uh, then then later uh, they, later when i met them both at my mother's in my mother's atelier I, we were discussing cinema in general with them and suddenly tuliki said that <clears throat> she has she has these huge amounts of eight millimeter film that she has been shooting from uh, from the beginning of their uh, trip to Japan. And I then afterwards, I began to be really interested in what it would be like and, and asked to, they had already trans transferred them to VHS. So I saw a little bit what it was, it was a huge amount of a film. And, and from that, then we proceeded with many different in, uh, phases, technical phases also, so that I began to edit the fir this first film that was shown now here. And uh, it was quite a job. There were hours of eight, eight millimeter film that was transferred to VHS that I had to then try to find the lo logic in this. <laughs> And so we discussed a lot with Tuliki and Tuve together. And Tuliki was very ambitious uh, in her shooting or filming. She really co considered it the same as in any other film form. So she didn't think that it was just some home movie. She was really, really ambitious. And, and you can of course see it also that she had an, also an artist's eye and gaze. So. Uh, so we had a, lo a lo lot of discussion about this, how, how we could proceed. And I took, of course, uh, I, I, I then listened to them and, and, and also, then afterwards showed them what I'd done. And it was a lot of, it was a, a cooperation really together. Of course, then all the mu music and sound work was not a little bit more, more not, not so much done with them. But, but the music was very in, in, important for Tuve, that which, which songs we will put there, you know, because she loved the California song and and jazz and uh, all the and the fifties songs of fifties. So they were really important. She she ha had to decide which pieces <laughs> we took there. Yeah. And can you tell us um, about um, where you recorded their audio? It was in um, Julie Key's film library. Um, you describe it in a very evocative way. She was yeah. a complete cinephile, wasn't she? And she had, you know, yeah. loads and so many VHSs. They were all marked. And yeah. can can you tell us yeah. a bit about that space of where yes, yes. where she, you recorded she, the audio yeah. and yeah. Yes, she fell in love with the cinema in Paris in the beginning of the uh, 50s when she was there very many times and lived long times, long, long um, times there and went to cinema. So then, uh, then when there were this, this fantastic possibility to record free films from TV that came then with the, the, the recorder. And, so uh, Tuliki began immediately to <laughs> to record her the her, her films that were important for her, but then also lots of other things 
a lot of other films that she she was quite ambitious here too that she wanted to kind of filmotech or kind of archive <laughs> of films of course they, but she took only films not uh, not uh, short films or, or tv programs but then when as she was a, a very uh, a person who was very keen uh, to read uh, detective stories and see detective <laughs> films or so uh, this was one of her specialities so she had a one corner where or where films detective films and books the same books the films that were uh, made uh, from these books they were together in one corner of her big big uh, apartment but otherwise they were all she made herself these shelves for the film so that the whole, whole the whole apartment was full of films from from floor to ceiling and uh, they were all marked with uh, different colors or is it french or italian they were the, also the the, the 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 flags of each country always <laughs> some description inside then of the film and it was it was fantastic she 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 was such a meticulous person and Tove Tove never participated in this but was she this is not my job this is not <laughs> but then they sat together and and they had the 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 film evenings then when Tuliki chose what to what to watch. And she said that she will educate Tove <laughs> to understand cinema. <laughs> that was her 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 words. And so so uh, this is this was a very nice, uh, comfortable corner uh, of of this apartment where they then sat and watched and where Tuliki recorded these films. And um, and what um because you know you, you you knew both of them so well. What insights you knew both yeah. of them so well, obviously, you know, from when you were a child. Mm -hmm. um, what insights do you think the films show about their personal lives? You know, they, they, they had a 40 year relationship together. They had a, a creative practice. What, what insights do you think we can learn from the films? Of the films? Yes, you can, you can see and you can see in the films what, what was their, let's say their, uh, how different, what was their, uh, roles in in, in the everyday life that Tuliki was the one that constructed and um, did all kind of mechanical and other kind of handiwork, and uh, Tuve was then Tuve did fish, but usually she she wrote or or read, and then of course made all kind of different things with what you can do in the on an island. I mean, now I'm speaking of the island. Mm -hmm. And and also otherwise, there she was, Tulik was the practical one and Tove was the one that did uh, drink whiskey and smoke. <laughs> watching watching Tulik do, you know, this. No, it's not quite true. But anyway, there was a little bit this kind of, and then Tulik participated very much in Tove's writing work. So Tuve, Tuve gave her uh, the excerpts of, of of her books or the, what, what she had written, and and uh, they had a very good co cooperation there too. So uh, she she uh, liked very much the, the opinions of Tuliki about her writing. So so it was um, in all, during all these. Decennies, or, so they grew. Of course, they, they lived over forty years together. So it 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 was not always. But they also they lived separate in separate yeah. apartments. So they then could choose when when they <laughs> wanted to see each other. So yeah, so. I mean, I think that's one of the readings that that Ellie's going to read. The second reading yeah. is about their lives as. <laughs> You know their couple, their their couple, their life as a couple, but also yeah. their their life as yeah. artists. So I think I'm just going to thank you so much, Kinova. But I'm now going to uh, turn to Ellie. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, but don't go away, please stay. No, no, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. I'm here. <laughs>
Um, so Ellie's now going to read an extract from Fair Play. Um, yeah, Ellie, over to you. Thank you. So um, the extract I'm going to read um, is called Travels with the Conica. Yona made movies. She'd acquired an eight millimeter Conica and she loved the small device and took it with her everywhere they traveled. Mari, she said, I'm tired of static pictures. I want to make pictures that are alive. I want motion, change. You know what I mean. Everything happens just once and right now. My film is my sketchbook. Look at that. There comes the Commedia dell'arte. And there they came, street performers with their plush rug, the child on the ball, the strong man who could swallow fire, the girl juggler. People stopped on the street and moved closer to the show. It was very hot. The light flickered and the shadows were a sharp, dark blue. Mari stood close beside Yona with an opened Kodak film in her hand. She was waiting for the camera's steady whirring to change speed, at which point she had to have a new role ready instantly. Another important job was keeping Yona's field of view open. Mari saw it as a point of honor to keep people from walking in front of the camera. Don't worry about them, Yona said. They're just extras, I'll kick them out. But Mari said, let me, it's my job. Equally important was finding Kodak film and Mari searched. In the cities, the towns, at bus stops, she kept an eye out for the golden red sign showing that here you could buy Kodak. Agfa seemed to be everywhere. It comes out blue green, Mari said. Wait, I'll find Kodak. And she'd search on all the while afraid that they'd encounter something fantastic, one of those never to be repeated street events that would play out before their eyes just as the film ran out and then have to wander on trying to forget what they'd lost. They traveled from city to city, Yona, Mari and Konica. Mari grew critical. She began giving instructions and advice and involved herself in questions of composition and lighting and bustled about looking for suitable subjects. They arrived at the great, great aquarium, at the dolphin's turquoise tank, and Mari grabbed Yona by the arm and yelled, wait, I'll tell you when it's going to jump, you're wasting film. And the dolphin corkscrewed high out of the water, sparkling in the sun, and Yona burst out, no, I missed it. Let me decide for myself. By all means, Mari said, you and your Konica. It was inconceivably beautiful and mysterious down in the dark passages where the tank was lit underground. The whales were diving. Through the glass walls, you could see the power of their dance as they plunged downward and turned and shot up into the light again. It's too dark, Murray said. You won't get anything. The film will just be black. Quiet, Yona said. The shark's coming. People pushed forward to see the monster and Mari threw her arms wide to stop them. The shark came, a slow gray shadow swept past close to the glass and vanished. Good, said Yona. I got it. You've always wanted to see a real shark up close. Now you have. Mari said, I didn't see it. What do you mean didn't see it? I was only thinking of the Konica. I'm always thinking about the Konica and not about what I see. It just goes by. But don't be angry. Yona held out her camera in both hands. Your shark is here. It's in here. When we get home, you can see it as many times as you want, whenever you want, and with music. Nothing made Yona happier than finding a circus. Or maybe even better, a Sunday carnival somewhere on a city's outskirts. They searched one out with a conica, heard at a distance the breathless staccato of the carousel. Yona started her tape recorder. I'll start here, she whispered. We'll get closer and closer, quite slowly. Anticipation. And our footsteps, then the vigil. They never rode the carousel. And later, a long time later, in her studio, Yona set up the screen focused the projector and turned off the ceiling light. Mari sat waiting with pen and paper. The machine began to whir and threw a rectangle of light across the screen. Make notes where I should cut, Yona said, and the repeats. 
Yes, yes, I know. And when it goes black. Their trip came toward them. Mari made notes. She wrote and wrote. And afterwards, she didn't really know where they had been. The clipping is even harder than the filming, Yona explained. When I've cut it, we can add music, but not yet. Music makes you uncritical. Yona, right now I want to see something with music and without taking notes. What do you want to see? Mexico, the empty carnival. You know, all the people who were too poor to ride the carousel. Yona put in the cassette an endless mournful marimba. The picture was blurry and shaky at first, but gathered itself suddenly into a long evening landscape, the empty field outside Masatlan. There was the drainage ditch running out towards the ocean, reflecting a last glimpse of the sunset in a long band of burning gold that quickly died. Then the barracks, the car dump, and now, far off, the ferris wheel with its many colored lights that rose and sank and rose and sank. The Konica came closer and you could see that all the little pleasure boats were empty. The picture moved over to a carousel that was also revolving and just as empty. Everything was sparkling and tempting and ready for fun, but the people strolling slowly through the carnival took no part in the amusements, they just observed except for some boys shooting at targets, whose stern faces Yona had caught in a close-up. As the film went on, dusk sank deeper over Masatlan. The people left, but the Ferris wheel kept on turning, now just a circle of rising and falling lights. It was almost night. The marimba played on. The back of the circus tent, indistinct. Some dogs rooting around in a rubbish dip. Terrible, Maury said. Terribly good. All those people who just had to go home without. But at least they saw it, didn't they? Didn't you get the ditch at the end too that sparkled? Wait, it's coming. The picture went black and stayed black for a long time. Several weak flashes of light, nothing more. And the screen was empty. Mari said, you have to cut that, no one will get it, it was too dark. Yona turned off the projector and turned on the overhead light. She said, right there, it has to be absolutely black, graphically black. But you were there now, weren't you? Yes, Mari answered, I was there. That was just yeah, Ellie, that was stunning. <laughs> it was really, really beautiful. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, I'm now going to turn to Nat. Hi. <laughs> so Nat um, is a sort of books who's basically since 2001 has translated and published Toby Janssen's work. So Nat, could you give us like a, a very brief kind of overview of what of your kind of experience of, of being part of yeah. Toby Janssen's oeuvre since 2001. And well, then I, also tell us a little bit about how you think the films connect with Tova's writing and, 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 deep, and deep an understanding, deep an, an understanding of it. Yes, I mean, can I first say that that was just such an amazing reading by Ellie because um, I noticed things that I hadn't noticed when I was reading. And there was a, a layer of humor that you know, I, I sense was there, but that came mm. out so amazingly. It was just so poignant, that reading. Just, you know, I, I went through every emotion listening to it. It's most extraordinary. Um, I, I, can I, can I relate what I want to say to the film uh, Travels with Torve? Is that, is that okay? Because That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, I was absolutely mesmerized by that film, Canerva, um, and by the commentary that was connected to the film. Mm. Because it's such a, a metatextual event, the whole thing. You have Torve and Tutti turning 80, looking at themselves turning 60. Mm -hmm. And and the, the camaraderie, the sort of, um, I suppose the word now would be banter, but this toing and froing of people who, who slip into each other's minds and who are open to each other's creativity 
chatting about a film that they're making. And in the film, the character of Torve is helping Tutti create her film, you know, um, uh, express her art. The commentary includes writing where Torve is showing her creativity and her art, you know, and the whole thing combining with these two women talking about that is just incredible. And there's something that uh, really comes across. You get the sense of the way these two women connect and have this deep connection. And it comes from such a profound respect for what they're both trying to achieve. And I don't, I can't imagine a relationship that either of them could have with someone whose art they didn't admire, but they completely admire each other's art. And it's very different. And I, I don't think people have quite a sense um, of what an important artist Tuliki Pietila was. Yes. That, yes. that she, she um, you know, because she, she uh, you know, the, the, the Moomin fame was absolutely immense and, thre and threatened to topple Torve. You know, it was completely all enveloping. But Tutti wasn't in her shadow, Tuliki Pietila, who's known as Tutti, she wasn't in her shadow. She was, she was in her own world too sort of forging mm. her own way. And this will relate to something that Ellie is going to read n next, I think. But, um, you know, she was a very, very significant engraver, particularly. And um, what I love about Fair Play, and I always, sorry, I'll show you the book. If, uh, this is Fair Play. It's a very slim book, but it contains just the most expansive, important writing about mature love and and how, you know, how, how to have a relationship where, where love endures um, while respecting each other's creativity. And something that, um, you know, and, and, and this is, I've got to say, this is a novel. I have to be fair to the book. It's a novel, um, but it's so clearly drawing the Jonna character is so like, like Tutti, the Marie character is so like Torvi, you know, they drew from incidents in their life. But the, um, there's something that um, the way that they both critique each other's work, they are their, each other's best critics. And that comes across in the film, it comes across in, the, in Ellie's reading of that story, it comes across throughout Fair Play. Um, can I show you something? This is a very sneak preview and it's not, I'm, it's not me trying to just, um, um, what, what, a product place or whatever, but, but uh, you'll know you'll know this book. Uh, this is the Finnish version of this book, Notes from an Island. But what Torve does after Fair Play at the end of you know her penultimate book is she takes twenty. They take twenty six engravings from the period of the travels, from that period where they went abroad. But this is of their island of Clove Haroon. But you know from the from the mid seventies. Tutti does these amazing engravings and they're, they're, they're paying homage to this island that they've had to relinquish, that they love, that they spent 26 summers on, that was part of themselves. They had to relinquish it because of age. And they get out these etchings, which are absolutely stunning. And Torve is going to lightly annotate them. But actually what Torve does, is she writes the most incredible text around it. And they create this combined work. And that's what you've done, Kineva, in, 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 in the films, which is such a combined work with mm -hmm. these two absolute consummate artists. I don't know. Am I? Am I? Am I being too? You know, I can wax on about. No, this it's now. wonderful. Thank you, Matt. It's, it's, oh, no. it's wonderful okay. response. Thank you. Yeah. But I don't yeah. think. Um, um, I think something I'd like to just just running into what um, um, you know something I would urge people to do is to look at the way Torve uh, relates to Tutti in her letters as well, um, because you know it's it's she in in her letter collection she goes through trying to find herself as an artist starting out with the moomins going through the the mill of love she really goes through the mill of love and she comes out of it into this safe harbor but not a safe uneventful unstimulating place but she comes she comes home to tutti mm -hmm. it's you, you just you know it's something 
you know, she's found someone who's strong, who's self-confident, who's, you know, all sorts of things and has a sort of love of privacy. So it means that she protects the privacy of Torve when the world is, is trying to get pieces from her. But I was, um, I've been very moved to see um, just the absolute respect Torve had for Tutti as well as Tutti had for Torve. So, yeah. and, and I think everyone who, who, who will be watching will know that the character Tutiki in Moominland Midwinter was based on mm. Taliki and, and Taliki's a major influence of, of Taliki in Torve's work was encouraging her and, and, and uh, reinforcing this move from the, the charm and adventurousness of the early Moomin books to something more layered and, and with, with, more, with more layered and more nuanced emotionally. So she allowed in darker emotions as well as the contrasting light ones. There's always a party at the end of a moment, but there's always something, you know, t there's always hope and fun, but there are darker emotions in some of those late in the last four moment books about loneliness, isolation, coping with life. That's, um, you know, has part to do. I don't, I can't speak for them, but I think that's, that was helped by her relationship with Taliki. And could I add a little bit also of about course, of Tuliki's role uh, towards uh, Tuve as a painter? Because uh -huh. Tuve had very many crises as a painter. She was first a painter. And, and then she, she tried in the 60s to renew her style and to, to find her, to find a new style. Uh, more abstract one, and, and then uh, and they were um, uh, living in Cité des Arts in Paris then, and Tuliki was really, really very, very supportive, and they had, they, they told me, and they had big, long discussions, and, and Tule was quite desperate about herself as an artist, but Tuliki all, all the time supported her, and said that yes you you must continue also paint but it then it was left uh, aside a little bit to we didn't continue so so many years and uh, anymore as a painter but there also Tuliki was a uh, really a big support can i can i add something just very quickly that um um the the that there's ellie is going to read something uh, a, a bit from the story a story called The Letter mm. at the end of the book uh, play. And it refers to a period where, to, if, we're, if we're looking for the life parallels in, in their life, um, yeah. Torve is, uh, Tuliki is invited to Paris to a residency, and this happens quite a lot. T Tuliki is in demand and it gets, was offered a studio in Paris. Yeah. What happens? Uh, I'll sort of jump ahead to the sort of sequel, really, Ellie, which is that that I got from the letters, is that Torve went to Paris and joined Tuliki. Um, and in Paris, in the studio they had, she recovered the urge to paint. And that absolutely um, links with what you were saying, Kaneva. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. It, was the last, it was her last sort of flourish as a painter. And what's so amazing is that one of the things that she paints is um, is this really lovely picture. I don't know if you can see it. This lovely yeah, picture yeah, of, this of, just... of Tutti in the studio. Yeah, uh, in the Cité des Arts in Paris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think, and, and, and also what she describes as her ugly portrait, which is, uh, yeah, is there. And it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, this is, um, you know, she was, you know, she, she was someone who, who said the urge is the most precious thing. And for that moment in her life, she got back the urge, which was just. Thank you, Nat. Thank you. And Kenova, thank you. It's just so, such wonderful insights to both of them as artists and, and, and their kind of partnership and lives together that, this just keeps unfolding. I mean, it just really does. Um, 
I now think we let's turn again to Ellie um, and Ellie's now going to read the second extract for us from Fair Play. Um, thank you, Ellie. Thanks. Um, so this section that I'm going to read now is called The Letter. Yona stared at her for a moment. Then she said, read this and handed her the letter. I don't have my glasses, said Mari angrily. Read it to me. And Yona read. She'd been awarded a studio in Paris for a year. The studio was meant for her use alone. The rent was very low. It was a great honor. Reply within 10 days. Good Lord, said Mar Mari. Is that all? She sat down and tried to rearrange her fears as best she could. So you see, I don't know what to do, Yona said. Maybe the best thing would be to turn it down. Any number of possibilities and impossibilities ran quickly through Mari's head. Sharing the studio secretly, renting something nearby, coming to Paris later when her illustrations were done, which would only take a few months. She looked at Yona and suddenly she understood. Yona really wanted to work in peace a whole year now that she was working really well. The best thing is probably to turn it down, Yona repeated. Mari said, don't do that. I think it'll be all right. You do? You really think so? Yes, I do. I'm going to need a long time for these illustrations. They have to be good. But I mean, said Yona, quite confused. Illustrations, exactly. They have to be good and that takes time. You may not realize how important they are for me. Of course I do, Yona burst out. And she launched into a long, earnest discussion of the importance of illustration, the painstaking labor, the concentration, the need to be undisturbed if you're going to do your best work. Mari was hardly listening. A daring thought was taking shape in her mind. She began to anticipate a solitude of her own, peaceful and full of possibility. She felt something close to exhilaration of a kind that people can permit themselves when they are blessed with love. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. So beautifully read. Thank you. Got goosebumps. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> it's like them, them speaking, discussing them. You, you really, you have something in your, it's not a voice, but your, how, how you, the rhythm and the accent and all this. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, so alive. <laughs> That's very but special. Also, but also, the, the, these words are edited and edited and edited. There's nothing out of place. And Ellie somehow just sort of catches the emotional layers so brilliantly, which yeah. were put there. <laughs> you found them. Yeah. Well, I think it's, yeah, it's, a very, it's brilliant writing, isn't it? It's one of my favourite books. I have read it a lot of times, this book. So yeah, oh. you always find something new in it. Yeah. Mm. I think um, Ali Smith, who wrote the, the, the um, forward, um, she said it's like a toolkit, isn't it? That, that's what she sort of got from reading the book. It's sort of a yeah. way to live. Yeah. Um, how, how to be in a, that's what we said, how to be in a relationship, but how to be an artist as well, really. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we're now going to turn to Ali. Um, Thank you for waiting to the end. So, um, Ali, you are, you're very important to this conversation because you have curated this exhibition that's kind of on at the, at the moment the, at the Walthamstow Wetlands. So can you tell us a little bit about the idea behind the exhibition and also, which is what we're talking about now, is about um, placing Toba and Tutti's art in conversation with each other, which will be the second part of the exhibition next year at the William Morris Gallery. Um, yeah, it, it's felt like a really um, magical project right from the beginning, I think, the way it's come together. And, um, we approached uh, Moomin with the idea, well, I say Moomin, we approached Rayleth and Sophia with the idea and they immediately understood it and embraced it and uh, wanted to be part of it, which was really lovely. Um, 
and, and that for me was particularly um, a magical moment um, was that they got it. Um, so at the time I was working um, for um, the council and I was managing um, a few venues, including managing the marketing for some venues, including um, the William Morris Gallery in <laughs> Wetlands. Um, and the Walthamstow Wetlands is Europe's largest urban wetland nature reserve. Um, it's a really important site for um, migrating birds. Um, and it has the same um, environmental status as the Amazon and the Nile. So you, you wouldn't expect it to be there in the middle of Tottenham under the A, I'm not sure what the name of the road is, but it's quite a busy A road and it's um, a lot of traffic. It's a very built up area. But underneath, you have this incredible wetland site, which um, has mostly been closed to the public for years um, and was opened um, probably about four years ago now. Um, you used to be able to go in, you could buy a fishing ticket and you could, you could sneak in. No one really, so not many people knew it, the site was there, I don't think. A few of my neighbours told me about it and I thought, I'll have to go and have a look. This is before it was open. And um, I went down there and it was really quite special. We found like the skin of a snake that was, <laughs> I didn't know we had snakes that big in London. It was huge. Um, there were the, you know, there's a heron island there. There's eight islands in total. One of them's called Heron Island. Um, and you see there's this gigantic herons nesting in the trees there. There's something quite, yeah, Amazonian about the place. It's just not, you know, not something you would expect in the middle of Tottenham Hale. Um, so I was really quite taken by the place. And um, also I'm from an island. My family are from um, an island off the west coast of Ireland called Ackle. It's about as far west as you can go. Um, it's a really, really beautiful place. And um, so for me, I think the fact that they were lots of little islands was very special as well. Um, and um, my, the reason that I, I've become so fond of Toby Janssen is my, my best friend, um, who I grew up with from about the age of four, um, her mother's Finnish. Um, and when she left university, uh, she moved back to Finland. And uh, so I spent quite a lot of time in Finland and uh, visiting her. And she, is, she was a big two-way fan for years. I came to Toby Janssen as an adult. I don't really remember the Moomins when I was young. I, don't, I definitely didn't have any Moomin books. I was deprived in that way. <laughs> um, so my friend really passed on her love of Moomins to me and was always sending me, you know, different Moomin gifts and all of Nat's beautiful books. And, mm. and I started reading her adult books, um, not the Moomin books. I actually read them, you know, much more recently. Um, so Sculptor's Daughter um, and is, is one of my favourite books. I actually love that book. And so, the summer book. So um, my friend, my Finnish friend, she um, we went to school together and she spent all her summers in Ackle with me. So we were all sent over to Ackle for the summer holidays and ran riot on this island. We, we used to stay with my grandma and because uh, my parents would be at work. So we'd be sent over to my grandmother for the summer and we'd, we'd drive her mad. <laughs> Just, we'd be out all night and up to all sorts. And, um, you know, we had the best times and um, we had, um, uh, yeah, we had some really fond memories of the place. So um, I, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but um, so Anna, Anna sent me all the books and that, and my love for Tuvo has grown, grown over years. And, you know, I visited Finland lots and we used to go, we've been a couple of times to just stand outside to his house, you know, where they have her, her face is, is, is on the door there. She's got the sculpture of, I think her father mm. did her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'd go and stand outside and we'd say, oh, I wonder what it's like in there. Wouldn't it be amazing to go and go and see what it's like inside? And um, so um, I was reading a uh, well, uh, sorry if my pronunciation is terrible, but Life, Art and Words at the time when I was working at the Wetlands. And I felt like the idea just kind of appeared, fully formed. 
<laughs> fairly fully formed in it, you know in itself it, it just appeared and I just thought this is this would be an incredible place to tell her story and also an incredible place you know to bring the movement because you know the values are so um, intrinsic to who Tovia was um, the fact that it's a nature of a um, it just felt like a really moomini place and mm. just somewhere that it would be wonderful to bring that exhibition and bring Tuve. And actually at the time we were talking about ways that the venues could work together more closely. So we were thinking about how the wetlands could work more closely with the, um, with the William Morris Gallery. And that just felt like it could, and obviously I'd seen the Dulwich exhibition, which I was a huge fan of, it was, it was so beautiful. Um, and I'd also been to the South Bank, um, and I was quite taken about um, by how many people at the South Bank were actually adults. You know, when I went, there wasn't any children. They were all adults. And, um, you know, she has such a, an appeal, a cross appeal. And um, uh, so we decided to call um, the exhibition The Woman Who Fell In Love With An Island after the quote. Um, have you read the story, The Man Who Loved Islands, a D.H. Lawrence short story, Toby uh, Janssen wrote in the spring of 1963, how about the woman who fell in love with an island? And we toyed with the, we were thinking, is it too long of a title? Um, but in the end, we thought, no, it's perfect. That's what, that's what we have to go with. And, um, so we, um, we, we actually, there's one picture, that, there's a picture that, someone took one of the islands on the wetlands and when you put it together with the summer book and the painting it's so striking they're so similar i'll have to put mm. <laughs> and, also, put that somewhere. And, and also alison you it's the only place where birds have the right of way which is very like torve's island <laughs> torve and mm. island yeah. you don't mess with those birds yeah. mm. No, yeah. <laughs> you don't. Yeah. They, uh, they had, um, they, they've got a goose there that they call the Asbo goose because he <laughs> gets quite aggressive. <laughs> They're like, don't go down that path because the Asbo geese are down there. <laughs> Stay away. Um, so, um, we, so, yeah, we, we figured that we, we couldn't bring any of her paintings to the wetlands. Uh, the engine house doesn't have the conditions um, for her artwork, um, but the idea is that we've um, opened the project up with this project, uh, with this exhibition this summer, which is um, mainly photographs and film, and um, we also have a slideshow as well from the Moomin Museum, um, and then next year we bring Tuve and Tuviki's work to uh, the William Morris Gallery. Um, the exhibition is accompanied by an audio piece by Erwin Cooper, who is a um, composer. He, his first album was about um, bird, birds. He's an um, <laughs> interest. There's, a, there's another synergy. This project felt very magical in so many ways. But one of the other synergies is that um, my co-curator, Mari, is also from an island. And we approached Erwin because we knew him from Borough of Culture. And we knew that he, you know, produced this song about birds, and um, and uh, but we didn't realise that he was from the Orkney Islands. So all three of us are from islands. <laughs> so um, that so the audio piece is um, we're so lucky to have been allowed to um, use Tuve's um, essay, the island, um, which is has never been hasn't there hasn't been an official um, English publication before. And so this is the first official English publication. And um, Sophia, who obviously is the creative director at Moomin, and um, there's also the inspiration behind the summer book. Um, she also lived on the island with Tuve. So there's some really beautiful footage that actually Nat um, Ford sent to me of Sophia on the island as a child um, with her father, who also and became part of the Moomin business. He, he probably lots of people who are watching who are Moomin fans already know that he drew a lot of the comic strips when it became really big for two and she couldn't um, do everything. Um, 
so Sophia reads this essay and Erland has scored it with um, music and sounds from the island, um, which the sounds have been collected um, from Toulay's Island by a Finnish artist um, who specialises in um, wildlife, gathering wildlife sounds. So mm -hmm. um, she's done a really, some really beautiful recordings and they've been weaved into the um, audio piece. And um, we were due to go to the island with him to record the sounds, but obviously because of COVID, um, the project was pushed back a year. And we didn't get to go, but I think that's something, there's something quite lovely about that as well. It's, it's a secret place. And I think in a way it should stay quite secret and quite, you know, um, I mean, I, I think there was some talk about bringing some journalists over, but I think they don't want too many people to go there. I think that's quite... Um, mm. Ali, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but we're sort of running, we're, no, no, I mean, I just wish I could, the event was is longer, but I wanted to leave some t time at the end. Thank you so much for telling us about, you know, the exhibition now and, and, and also the plans for next year. I'm so super excited to, to see the exhibition next year. And it's just wonderful that you're bringing their work together. Um, and I wish I could talk to you about when you went to Helsinki and you went to Tova studio, but we're sort of running out of time and I just wanted to see if there's anybody who had any, um, I mean, I've heard that I think lots of people are making, you know, um, writing some really wonderful comments about the event and they're really, they're, they're loving, you know, the, you know, what we're discussing and, and the readings. But I just wanted to check um, if there's anybody who's got any questions they wanted to ask anyone um, or comments or anything about the film. Um, now is your time. And now I'm just going now we're just gonna have a little pause to wait. Can I just hop in and say that it's an amazing experience. The the subtlety of the Wolfram Stowe project is it seems very Torve like. And, and having the soundtrack by Erlen Cooper really fits what Canerva was saying about Torve really caring about the music that goes with mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it sounds fantastic. I really would like to come myself too. Hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you for saying that, Nat. So there's, um, there's a question from Ted, not a question, um, but says, Tuliki also designed some of the covers of Tova's adult literature in one of the editions of Art and Nature, for instance. Can you even see the Grok disclosed as urban windows in the dark night? You can even see the Grok disclosed as urban windows in the dark night. I guess it's kind of just a comment, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can't tell about that now myself. No, that's fine. Mm. Uh, um, Okay. How do we see the comments, Selena? I'm not. Seeing... Oh, they get they, they get sent through to me. You can't see them on the phone. Ah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we we are, we keep a record of it, so we okay. we can show you we can show you afterwards. Okay. Um, but, but Torve Torve was um, um, uh, the books were so successful and so international that she was constantly creating covers for different languages as well. Mm. So, so uh, and and in uh, the process was different now, so that. Um, she would send her whole artwork off to the printer, or off to the publisher in, say, Estonia, and then somebody would want to cover in London or, or Paris or whatever, and she would need to either create another one or, you know, I mean, not always. Sometimes she'd get the cover back and send it on, but there were you know, changes, small changes. Sometimes it was changes which were sort of publisher-led, but there were so many she worked so hard. Yes, she never worked changed hard. anybody, did she? She always gave mm. you know, the work that went into each image was extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's why they, they needed their solitude as well, didn't they? Because the output was so prolific as well. Um, so there's another comment here. Love how the film shows how they were always themselves. At one point they mentioned someone laughed at Tutti's hat. Mm -hmm. Yet she still always wore those hats and Tova always danced because they loved it. So inspiring. That's from Amber. That wasn't the cowboy hat, was it? <laughs> I love that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Because she loved westerns, didn't she? I mean, that yeah, was one of her genres she that she was... Con- the, all the Fords and, and all the westerns, main, main, main uh, films, western well, films. The ultimate male bonding films. <laughs> yeah, also. <laughs> yeah. I had, um, I think oh, we've got another comment from Ted again. Um, Oh yes, this is this is an interesting comment. Imagine it, it had to be quite hard traveling as a as a queer couple, as a lesbian couple in those times. Um, I actually read that when they went to Italy, they weren't allowed to rent a room together in the inn because it was considered inappropriate. Uh-huh. Is that? I I mean I'm. Yeah. That's interesting, I, but I think that's something that we always are conscious when we watch these yeah, films. There's yeah, this. They never they never told all these kind of difficulties. It, it's uh, a, a bit strange because otherwise we spoke up all kind of questions and uh, but but they never thought of this kind of difficulties really. But I uh, I, I remember that they had uh, the same room in in Madrid and and also in France and in Paris, of course. Then, if not the the Cité des Arts, so some hotel in London also. So I, I don't, It perhaps Italy was just so, <laughs> so still so. But we also don't know what so. it meant. We don't know what it meant. It might have been that they didn't like unaccompanied women to be staying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps, very, like, yeah, that could be a little bit. Yeah. I think, as I said, like we, this is something as a, for contemporary viewers, we're so conscious of this that they, mm. You know, they kind of pass as these kind of older women, you know, sisters or whatever. But you know, they're in a very deep, long, loving relationship and have been for you know for decades. And there's this sort of intimate, coded, private language, and you can see that from two T shots. That you know, especially mm-hmm. places like in the states, you know, what mm-hmm. they're shooting, like the silk stocking, or yeah, there's yeah. that billboard of kind of ladies only. I mean, there's all this mm-hmm. stuff that as queer. You can kind of, you know, do this wonderful yeah. kind of kind of queer readings, which I, you know, it's just wonderful for me. I just, it's just so rich. Well, and the story in Arizona, uh, in Fair Play, where there's there's a, a maid in the hotel who who rearranges their nightwear, their pajamas. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and it's just so beautiful, and the, and strikes up this lovely friendship. And mm-hmm. you know, nothing is explicitly stated, but it's yeah. it's you know. Yeah. It's very obvious that she knows mm-hmm. exactly the nature of their relationship and is really, you know, and, and it's a very positive response. Yeah. But of course, they, 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 they didn't speak about the queerness so, so a lot because they were people who had just been illegal in 19, till 1971 in Finland. So, uh, and they had uh, heard about that too, and uh, they, many of them were their friends. So I think that that affected them till, till the old age. They were not so very, too open about it, except to some friends or near friends, but they really didn't want to. They, for, for example, they didn't want that Tuliki was adamant that the main newspaper in, in Helsinki could not come and interview Tuve and Tuulik. She said no, because she knew that they would ask about it. Yeah. So they were, this, this is a very important point. Yes, absolutely. You know, they're from a completely different generation, aren't they? And, um, and there's, there's kind of, there's a, there's a lived experience of that as well that, 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 that we can see in the films and, and in the writing. Um, mm. But I'm afraid, I'm so sorry, but we're now, the time has come to finish our discussion. I know um, I'm feeling really sad because I've really enjoyed putting this event together. <laughs> and, yeah. um, but I just wanted to, if the people are here, if you wanted to carry on talking or discussing about the film or what we've discussed this evening or some of the writing, please do you know, jump on social media, you know, because that's obviously another way that we can keep the conversation going. Oh, whose dog is that? That's mine. That's great. <laughs> Um, but I just wanted to thank Kenerva so much for joining us from Helsinki. 
Thank it's you really, for really pleasure to really pleasure to have you thank with you us. Thank for you. For, and I would like to thank also Ellie for this beautiful Ellie, and fantastic, Ellie, beautiful, yes, and Ali for the information about them, and then of course Natta to see to see you again and hear your beautiful comments also, and yeah. Celine for gathering. No, us. it's a pleasure, yeah. pleasure. Um, so thank you all of us, Ellie. Ali, Nat, Kanova, thank you so much. And just to say that Travels with Tova will continue to stream on the ICO platform until Friday week. Um, mm -hmm. So please tell your friends um, because it's such, a, it's such a beautiful, beautiful film. And of course, we're all going to now going to run to the Walthamstow Wetlands and the William Morris Gallery <laughs> oh, to see I Ali's envy, envy curation. You. I really envy oh, I wish you, you could come. <laughs> <laughs> And we and look Ali, forward. You are, Ali, you are welcome year, to Helsinki we'll whenever. To William Morris Park. Yeah, that's wonderful. Ali, you, you are welcome to Helsinki. Then, if you come, if you want to come to see the island, then. Oh, yeah. me or Ali? Yeah. You, you, <laughs> Ali, Ali. I don't know how how to pronounce your name, Ali. Ali. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, I'd love that as soon as I yeah. can fly. <laughs> Okay. I have to say that, that the film is on a, a sail. It's projected onto a sail in the Walthamstow wetlands, which is so lovely. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. sounds stunning. Oh, I can't wait to visit. That's something. Oh, that's what Tove would have loved. It. That too. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. It's inspirational. Constant, constant battle against the pigeon mm. poo. <laughs> <laughs> how do we how do we hear a recording of this because i'd love more people to listen to ellie reading those pieces it's going to be on the platform and then we have as, a, as, a, as an archive so so would you we'll send a link so that we yes can... yes absolutely great because just to make sure that the people at moomin moomin.com and everything mm. hear ellie reading that absolutely yeah, yeah that would be fine really great Okay, I think we need to, we need to, unfortunately, I really enjoyed it. leave each other. Have a nice summer. <laughs> until the next time. Yeah, until next year, perhaps. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thanks for a wonderful day. Cheers. Bye. Bye.